How come you never talked to me in high school? We talked. Miss Vogel's class? Once. You said something about the pencil sharpener. I really liked you. Yeah, I know. You have a good voice. Pardon? Thanks to me at Karen's house when you sang lead. The band sounded more soulful than tonight. Anyway, it's just my opinion. You guys don't have a name yet? Well, his latest idea. He wants to call us the Lord Byrons. He's got a lot to say. Time is on your side. Hi everybody, I'm Peter Travers and this is Popcorn where we tell you what's happening at the movies and there's a real happening right now called Not Fade Away, written and directed by David Chase and starring Bella Heathcote and I very cleverly have invited both of them <laughs> to the show today. So who wants to start by saying what Not Fade Away is? She, you wants, think? To she oh. wants to do it. You as not being the writer or the director. Yeah. Uh, should be the one that knows. I'm too close to it. Too close <laughs> to it, yeah. He's going to do that. He's going to just give me a hard time. I'm going to say, David, it's really your story, isn't it? And he's going to say, no. Yeah, right. Tell the truth now, though. Look, I love this film, and I feel like, for me, it's kind of about this group of boys in a band who want to be the Rolling Stones, and they never quite get there. Uh, and then there's this, this stories. Uh, that run alongside it that are just incredible about these families which are just completely dysfunctional. And then the most normal relationship in the film I think is between, you know, John and myself, the, the two kids. Uh, yeah, it's just great. It's so realistic. The two kids. So do you buy do you buy this explanation? I do. Completely. Look at that. Well, then our work Completely. is done here. There's no need oh, to go no. on to do any of this. Go yeah, on. that's it. It's all over. <laughs> we see on the poster there in a kind of magic marker that says, from the creator of The Sopranos. Mm -hmm. Now, when you see Not Fade Away, I don't see any sense of The Sopranos at you don't. all, except for James Gandolfini's presence. But he's not Tony, you know? No, he's not Tony. These, do you think that will mislead somebody when they come in to see this coming of age story and think they're going you to mean, get that, the Sopranos to? You mean that tagline yeah. to mislead yeah. people? Mm -hmm. You know, I never thought about that. Uh, um, I think juxtaposed with that picture, I don't think there's any frame of the Sopranos that looks like that. <laughs> there isn't. Uh, so, um, you know, there would have been something else. Uh, I don't think it's going to be that confusing. I mean, the movie's not like that at all. I mean except that it takes place in New Jersey. It's about Italian-Americans, and it's got James Gandolfini. <laughs> Otherwise, there's nothing. And there's also some music. Yeah, there is some music. Yeah, yeah. Some, some, some needle drops. Yeah, other yeah than that. that all happens, too. Where, can you talk a little bit about the time that it's set in? It goes from 1960, well, really, in the movie, it goes from 1963 to 1968, to mm -hmm. the, from uh, the summer of 63 to the winter of uh, early, early spring of 1968. Um, which is a time from, from which, for my money, a lot of the best music ever, popular music ever made, was created then, and that's what was my real interest was the music, not not so much the '60s or you know, tie dye or anything like that. What is that music saying to you? Now? Yeah, no. Then what was it? What was it to you? I mean, I, I don't know that I could have formulated it at that time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it just seemed so cool. It just seemed really good and really deep, and I was. You know, for part of that time, I was in college studying uh, English literature and American literature, and I, I, I sometimes think I didn't get as much out of that as I got out of uh, Between the Buttons or something, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think what happened was African-American music from the Mississippi Delta became popularized through Chicago, Chicago blues. The British picked that up and then brought it back here. And... And so it took American pop music and made it, you know, instead of songs about your car or about your girlfriend, it introduced the things that people at that age in their late teens and early 20s are worried about, which is they start to think about mortality. They start to think about who am I, why am I here? They start to think about betrayal and work and sex and all of that. And I think um, the music started to reflect that. And it became a lot deeper than 
well, we don't have to say any names, but then, that pop it, then pop it, then. Well, you are not part of that era, but you're growing up in Australia. What does this music mean to you? Was it ever a part of your life, this classic rock? It's so funny because John and Jack and I were talking about it yesterday, and uh, we all grew up listening to that music. Uh, our parents listened to it and so we were brought up on it and I assumed, you know, naively assumed that everyone of my generation grew up listening to this music because I think it's, you know, incredible timeless music. Uh, but I suppose some people weren't that fortunate. Uh, yeah, I definitely grew up listening to it, even all the way in Australia. Well, there's a wonderful scene in the movie that's been commented on a lot where you're, you and John are in the movies looking at Antonioni's blow up. Yeah. And where the music is. Was that a movie that you were familiar with before this? I wasn't. So mm -hmm. that was uh, one of the joys of working on this, was that I got introduced to films that I wasn't so familiar with. Good. See, so you were doing something. You're, this is a lesson as well. Well, yeah. I don't want to go down as like a school teacher, but <laughs> that, that was, um, <clears throat> it was kind of, a, it was kind of a, one of my motives for making the movie was that I felt very lucky to have been that age at that time. And I think I lived through some really good music and movies. Mm -hmm. And I sort of wanted to say that and show it to some people who maybe hadn't seen it or weren't aware of it. And at the same time, I'm also concerned because I know a lot of people in their 20s go, oh, those baby boomers with their music, you know, and their <laughs> long hair and all that stuff. Uh, and I, I, I can see why people would think that, but I don't think this movie, it doesn't cover the same territory, really, as other movies do. I hope. Well, it doesn't because it's, but it, it really covers in a way like you do on The Sopranos too. There's somehow the pop culture of that moment seeps into what we're watching. So it's a part of the fabric of the movie, which is why I think it's such a personal movie, even though I know you're going to tell me it isn't. But you did have a band, didn't you, Dave? I was a member of, a, of an organization, some sort of an organism that... Uh, an organism. organism that exuded <laughs> music once in a while. Um, what was it called? We never had a name. We name. never settled never on had it. A never name. settled on a name. We that talked about a... that all the time. We talked mm -hmm. about everything, mm -hmm. but we didn't play a lot. And I, and I was, the, the, my friends in that band were really good musicians. In fact, a couple of them went on to have sort of careers in music, but I didn't. But and, and under that, that group of people, we didn't, we didn't accomplish much. Um, but they had, been, they had been like a hot band in high school, so they were riding on a reputation. And they thought everybody was waiting for us to finally play, and we never did. Had you seen any of Bella's work? What no, was that? No. I don't think there was much to be seen. I had not. I had not. Dark Shadows wasn't. Uh, it wasn't around. Then. I think no. that it came. At, I think actually the production came after it also. Uh, no, I hadn't. I just um, was in the room and in came this creature, and um, <laughs> she was great. I do. The only thing I remember is, and she when she finished reading, I said, "Do you smoke?" Because that was I knew we were going to have to have people who smoked. So. That was my sensitive... Um, what did I say? Did I lie? <laughs> you said, I've been known to have a cigarette <laughs> <again."> <laughs> been known to have. You can't ask an actor whether they do that. They're all going to tell you I was they can think ride. An ambiguous <laughs> answer right. that I Because I was either. terrified. I was, you, know, I had, you had to have smoking, and I really didn't want to get on the set and then have actors say, oh, by the way, uh, sorry, pal. You know? Yeah, this has got to be real. This is, uh, yeah, we must do it this way. And we've gotten a lot of cards from... Uh, during test screenings, people just I hate all that smoke. I hate that movie. I hate all that smoking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Had you seen The Sopranos? Had you seen? Uh, I actually hadn't this? prior to shooting, and I only started watching it. I mean, I was I, obviously I'd heard about it, but I'd never seen it. And then I started watching it after um, after I got the gig because I knew that if I saw any of it prior, I'd be way too intimidated. And I'm really glad that I had the sense to do that <laughs> because otherwise I would have been, you know, terrified of Jim at the table read. I forgot to say goodbye. What? And then she came running back to say goodbye. That's such a, you forgot. I'm gonna stop crying. <laughs>